Multi hazards. All about protecting communities. Woo wee, more season three. Vin Nelson, your host here, and I'm podcasting from the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasin, Kikite, and Kwikwetlem peoples, who are the various First Nations groups around me here in Greater Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. So, great. I have Kevin, it's O'Reilly, right? Kevin O'Reilly? Yeah, that's right, Kevin and O'Reilly. U.S. P-I-R-G. And I'm just wondering, first question I ask all my people these last uh, year and a, or so, how you're surviving this pandemic and all the social ups and downs, twists and turns. And it's not a so-called normal time to be living in, right? No, it definitely isn't a normal time to be living. But, you know, I feel pretty lucky. I um, have been able to continue to work remotely and um, have not had to go out and brave um, so much of what's happening right now. So I feel very lucky. It has been a difficult time. Um, how have you been holding up, Ben? Um, it's been a challenge, but it's been, it's good. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we could be worse. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. So, yeah. And um, like just, there's a forest grove right outside my house. So I was walking in there and uh, yeah, there's like people living in tents there in the middle of winter. So, so when I see that, I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, I think we've got it pretty good. So <laughs> yeah, important to count your blessings for sure. Exactly. Now I started out by looking at, I think it was your blog on the USA PIRG and, um, and you were talking about like, I guess when you're a teenager and you had a story with your dad and you were kind of repairing stuff, if I can recall it. And uh, that was on introducing junk design. So I wonder if you have any kind of elaboration or extra comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, I wasn't necessarily a repair head when I was a kid, but I was, I'm a millennial. And when I was a teenager, um, you know, my dad liked to think he was a techie. He always wanted to get the new iPod, the new um, gadget. At one point he invested in this, um, video call technology it was like a phone with a screen a small screen and a camera in it even though it was 2008 and Skype had already taken the world by storm tried to advise him against it but that was kind of techie that my dad was um, but you know he would often call me I'd be hanging out with friends and he would call just like incensed because he thought that I had done something to break the tv or that um, the reason that the wi-fi went out um, and he was often so frustrated and I would try to kind of talk him through it through it and be remote tech support but ultimately so many times he would just kind of sigh and and was really uh kind of distraught and he'd say you know they just don't make things like they used to um and now as I've gotten older um you know I think like everybody else we start to realize man our parents weren't that wrong but he, I think his point is, is totally true that they don't make things like they used to. Um, things these days are not made for durability. They are made to be used and then to be thrown out so that you buy a new device again in two or three years, whether it be our cell phones, headphones, um, smart home devices, right? We've seen a lot of examples of um, you know, planned or premature obsolescence um, where kind of by design. So one example we talked about in the blog was um, the the Sonos um, speakers that were being put into recycle mode, right. uh, which basically meant they were being bricked, right? It was, okay, this we're not going to support this device anymore, so you can't use it. Um, so this, you know, the speaker that Sonos are, makes great speakers, this thing that you've been using and you bought with the intention of using as long as you could, you can't use it anymore. Well, there was a ton of backlash to that. And ultimately, Sonos ended up um, reversing that decision. And that since has made um, some, some good strides towards more repairable um, products. They actually recently released a uh, do-it-yourself battery replacement kit because we know that batteries are one of the quickest ways to drive this kind of planned obsolescence because they have to be repaired after a year and a half, two years. So it's, mm-hmm. it's exciting to see some uh, manufacturers going in the right direction, but as a whole, we see so many products that are, are made to be just replaced and rebought every two years. Right. 
I just want to do a little segue there. I, it would be interesting if somebody did a peer reviewed university study and compared like a line of products from say the 1930s and a line of products from today and to see, is it really true or whatever the fifties or the seventies, whatever nineties. Mm -hmm. And just, is it really true that things lasted longer back then? Or is it just sort of, you know, old people, projecting onto the past and you know it's only the products that survive that we're focusing on we're forgetting about that there was like another whatever 70 percent that didn't survive and but anyway i'm just saying you know but i think you you have tracked in recent years there is this it's an actual traceable proven thing that that companies are making things so that they're junked earlier right Whereas before, they probably didn't think about it. They just made something. They thought, hmm, if we make it a little bit more durable, uh, people will notice the quality and they'll appreciate it more, right? Yeah, I actually recently saw um, CBS here in the States did a special on right to repair. And they they talked about an old Maytag um, who makes you know washers and dryers and things like that. There was an old ad from maybe the 80s that was literally touting how when you buy a Maytag washing machine or dryer, this thing is going to last for a very long time. And that's what they were talking about in their advertisement versus you look at advertisements today and it's the new hot thing with the great camera or this kind of new technology that you've never seen before that's going to improve your life. So I think that's kind of indicative of the shift that's happened. But in addition to that, I think cell phones are a prime example. So, oh, yeah. you know, back, back in the day when I got my first flip phone, um, I could pop the battery right out just by, you know, all it was was a little lever that I needed to pull up and I could pop the battery out and put a new replacement in or um, I could have a backup battery if I was doing a long trip, those kind of things. Versus today, um, batteries are often A, inside of housing, inside of smartphones that you need special tools to get into, um, which you can do. I've, I've done that myself. I replaced my iPhone 7 battery. I was pretty proud of myself. But um, in <laughs> addition to that, you know, Apple... Um, has created a proprietary pentalobe screw, which is a screw that we've never seen before. It was it showed up on the iPhone. Um, so that means you have to have a special screwdriver to do it. And then Apple, as well as other manufacturers, um, have increasingly used adhesive rather than screws or, or other mechanisms to keep, um, to like lodge the battery into the, um, the device, which just makes it a lot more difficult to remove and to replace. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, this is just kind of the trend of the way things are going, and um, it's, it's not the way we want things to keep going. Well, the, the reason I started, like, searching online about this topic, because my this podcast is called multi -hazard. so looking at anything that kind of threatens us, so to speak, and then how we can protect ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. It could be disaster management, every, but to me, this is a da disaster to me, because I'm old enough to remember like we had 33, 45 records and we got eight tracks then we got cassettes, then we got CDs. So this was kind of a gradual evolution that happened every few years. And you could expect that whatever you bought, you know, it'll, it'll be there, you know, you'll have to stick it in the attic or the basement or somewhere. But mm -hmm. now it's just so frustrating where it's like, you just, you just touch something the wrong way and it breaks. Right. And um, unless now, I, I think there's probably rich people. I live across from an area where it's like super rich people. We're kind of on the other side of the freeway, but mm. they probably have their ways of figuring out stuff that is actually very good quality, which probably costs five times the price, right? So I don't know. I haven't researched if those things even exist, but from my level, you know, you have a laptop computer and then you know, a, a year or two, something happens, or it's not working, and you have shoes that don't last as long as you want, or as you're saying, the phones, and you're like, I don't know, sometimes you think there's a conspiracy, somebody's out to get you, right? Well, yeah, I don't know, we could talk conspiracies, we might have to do that <laughs> exactly. for a beer sometime, Ben, but, you know, I think, I don't even know that it's it's necessarily that if you're willing to pay more money, that they're still not going to pursue this disposable design um, kind of business model. So one example of that is um, the AirPods Pro, right? So these are $249 um, uh, wireless, you know, Bluetooth headphones that um, they're super sleek. They're really small. They're, I personally would just be terrified of losing them because I never know where my keys are to begin with. But um, 
you know, the, the way that these things are constructed, they have a battery inside it, a lithium ion battery, which is guaranteed to wear out over time, just like, you know, anybody who's had a cell phone or um, wireless headphones like this before has seen 18 months, three years in, um, the battery just doesn't last as long. It might keep for an hour rather than a full day. Um, so these AirPods are $249 device, dollar devices, like I said, not cheap. Um, and yet you cannot get into the um, into the device and replace the battery without completely destroying the headphones. So that makes wow. them just disposable products, really. And I think that's the way that it goes is it's not so much that, you know, they're offering lower quality at, at different um, pay scales, but it's, it's really just the way that they can make the most money is by continuing to just get you to buy a new thing and buy a new thing and buy a new thing. And you talk about hazards, you know, the fact of the matter is, is this stuff is contributing to uh, electronic waste becoming the fastest growing part of our waste stream. Um, you know, I, I know here in uh, the United States, we throw away something like 165,000 cell phones every single day. Um, and the rare earth metals that make our technology run, whether it be a cell phone or a laptop or, um, you know, even these uh, wireless headphones, um, those can leach really toxic chemicals into the environment and also just take a lot and a lot of material and a lot of um, raw material to create. So this is not a sustainable practice. We need to get back to the to the days where things were sold to last a long time and we had the, the parts, tools, and information we needed to fix our stuff when it broke. Right. Now, I, I don't want to be apocalyptic here or anything, but it seems like if you stay, for example, I, I know some people from Congo and they have, what is it, cobalt there and it's in every single mm -hmm. cell phone. But you can't just keep, digging and keep digging and keep getting and then you have different countries everybody's fighting over that cobalt here and then there might be some over there and there's going to be a limit where these things start to be in um just not available and right. so it's going to affect the whole global supply chain and then you know it's things are going to contract because it just it just can't go forever so yeah no it's, uh, it's totally true and you know that's why we at US Perg are doing everything we can to make sure our stuff lasts as long as possible. Um, you know, the, the campaign that I work on, we are trying to pass right to repair legislation, which is all about making sure that we have what we need to fix our stuff when it breaks, because, you know, manufacturers from Apple to John Deere to, you know, Medtronic who makes ventilators in, and, you know, everything in between to home appliances, all of these different um, industries make it really difficult um, and put up barriers to self-repair to third-party repair just so that they that you have to go through them to do so. Um, and you're right, the, the way that we are consuming is not sustainable. We need to start thinking now before we get to a emergency scenario, um, which some could argue with the climate and the way that things are right now, we're already there. But we need to start making our stuff last as possible because we need to, to work in harmony a little bit more. Yeah. Um I just want to kind of go up to the sky level and then come back down to local level. But um, mm -hmm. I'm reading a book right now about it's about the American Revolution and how it's so funny. Sorry about this. I know everybody there loves their revolution, but it's kind of like how it kind of screwed up the whole world. And it kind of set off a series of revolutions and problems and issues like in all these different countries. And this historian is kind of going through this. And of course, a lot of it is about colonial history. And it's mm -hmm. like it's like we built the system over all these European countries kind of uh, building ships and just going around the world and establishing this huge uh, global system, which is a whole bunch of empires as a kind of like now merge into one global system. But it's kind of like we have this thing where it's like this market. It's got an insatiable appetite and it just keeps going on and on until as we were saying it just hits this limit it just can't go anymore and um for example we had a should i mention this on the air but uh, your president just came in and canceled this uh, keystone pipeline so we have a couple of our provincial premiers here in canada are so angry they're like oh they're calling on our prime minister to kind of like fight back and and I'm thinking, what can we do to fight back? But it's just, it almost seems like, it seems like a, a crusade or a, a, it just, 
compelling people to just be so passionate about extracting resources. It's just like, if they don't do it, they're just like, they're going to die. And it seems like, well, the thing you're dealing with is kind of like at the user end, it's more like, okay, we've extracted all the resources. We've made these fancy phones and now we're going to let you buy it, but it's only going to be for a year. So there's this cycle now. It's like they sell it, we buy it, we use it, we trash it. Then the resell that, not the same thing, a new thing. And then we buy the new thing. And it's just like new, 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 new. Everything's new. It's almost like this new religion we started. It's called the new worship mm -hmm. of the new. And it's kind of like now your, your group is coming in. And um, I did do some research. I found like, wow, you were, there's some involvement with Ralph Nader, like over the years. It's like, uh, you've been around a long time and you've got that university connection, but it's just refreshing to see groups. And we have groups in Canada too, and other countries, they're trying to, <laughs> it's kind of like fighting the beast, right? Sort of the David mm -hmm. and Goliath scenario, just try to stop some of this cycle at least parts of the cycle so that people can get a break so sorry yeah. that was my little rant there but no no I, I appreciate it i mean um i think you're absolutely right and you know talking from the three thousand foot kind of more esoteric level that is a lot of what drives our campaigns at us perg is kind of questioning this model of endless production endless growth endless consumption because the fact of the matter is that we're going to find an end at some period of time and that's going to lead to really disastrous results for you know whether it be the usa or canada just humanity in general so we've you know a lot of our work whether it's um the stuff like right to repair or you know we have other campaigns where we're looking to move beyond plastic right we use um styrofoam in plastic containers for maybe five minutes and then throw it away and it uh, pollutes our environment for 500 years. Um, there's so much that we could do to move away from this kind of linear system of extraction, consumption, and disposal to a more circular system, to a, you know, a circular economy where we are taking the stuff that we're using, thinking about how we can continue to reuse it, and instead of sending it to the landfill, find new purposes or repurpose um, this, this stuff so that we can, you know, stop extracting, stop burning and burning, you know, uh, fossil fuels for production of these things. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a fair point. It's a, the direction that we need to go. Right. Exactly. Now I was doing research and I don't know about, um, your, like you were us perg, the office you were working was out of Boston or somewhere like that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So but you yourself we, are a yeah. California fellow, right? Well, yeah. I'm from California originally. Um, okay. but now I live in Boston. Okay. Um, it's, it's getting cold here. I wasn't built. Oh, I can imagine. But do you have these like repair cafes? Because for example, I heard, I saw a website and they actually had a map of where I live, greater Vancouver. And they're like, Oh, there's like this repair cafe and this repair place. And so, uh, it's kind of like mapping out things. So do you have that kind of movement where they got to these kind of local repair shops? It might be some university students or some techies and they're just volunteer to do it or do it for a nominal fee totally we see those all over the place in the states um, okay so you know i think those are a, a great example of um what repair can do for a community right because those events are community focused events where um you might have students who um, who come in and are interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, and can use this as a way to um, to learn a little bit more and get their hands on technology and give them kind of some useful skills and inspire them to pursue a STEM path, which, you know, is, of course, an, an important part of this. But also, you've got, you know, older folks and little kids, all these people coming together um, to, you know, kind of bond around repairing their stuff and making it last longer. I know that um, uh, Nathan Proctor, our uh, campaign director at US Perg uh, for Right to Repair, he brought his kid in with one of his um, favorite toys that had broken. And he was able to get help from a coach to fix that toy. And the sense of pride that um, his son felt when that was all over was, was real. And that's just a cool feeling when you can interact and engage with the stuff that you own in a, in a little bit of a deeper way it gives you more of an appreciation for it um 
one thing, you know, I will say is, you know, one of the real um, great um, presences here in the States uh, for the Repair Cafe kind of movement and things that uh, was John Wackman, who uh, actually recently wrote a book called Repair Revolution that I would definitely recommend um, okay. checking out. But he uh, recently passed away, which was a really big loss for the repair community. And, um, right. you know, we're definitely thinking about his family and his folks and, um, you know, mourning his loss in the repair community. Okay, right. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to get back on track here where we no were. Right. Now, so we got the repair cafes, but um, your organization I saw is kind of more like a lobby group. And um, is that right? It's more like pushing for at the high levels legislation so that that um, different kinds of products can be repaired because there might be some legal reason not to repair it or just like it's the design reason. Like if you try to repair it, it'll get broken. <laughs> so you want to make sure that there's legislation so that repair can be done on most products, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, US Perk, we're a public interest nonprofit advocacy group, and we do advocacy work. So we do definitely work with um, legislators at the state and federal level. Um, but we also do a lot of organizing and working with you know, um, people who own local repair shops or farmers who are frustrated because they can't fix their tractor or biomedical repair technicians who in the wake of this pandemic have not have faced barriers to repair and haven't been able to fix their equipment in a reasonable amount of time and haven't been able to, um, you know, deliver the care that COVID-19 patients need. Um, so we work with all those folks and, and try to use the public and, and our um, win hearts and minds and then influence our um, elected officials to, to act. So a big part of what we do is um, advocate for right to repair legislation, um, especially in the states. We already have, I think, something like 14 states across the country have filed right to repair bills in the United States so far. Um, we think it could be as many as 25 um, this year, which is exciting stuff. But um, yeah, the, the base of, of right to repair legislation is basically we want to make sure that third parties and individuals are provided with the, you know, the parts. Um, so whether that's like a replacement battery or replacement screws, things like that, um, the tools that they need. So if there's um, proprietary screws, like I was talking about, making sure that the screwdriver ton to, you know, unscrew those things is, is made available. And then other things like software keys, because there are a lot of software locks and software has made its way into more and more products that we use in our daily lives. Um, you might need a software key to uh, diagnose a problem and authorize repair um, and other things like that. And, you know, one of the important aspects of this is that we're not asking for um, any manufacturers to hand over any intellectual property or, you know, give any sort of like source code or anything like that. The thing that we really want is to make sure that um, individuals and third parties can have the same access to the repair tools that a manufacturer authorized technician has. Um, at a fair and reasonable price, which we think is a, a very reasonable ask. It's it's wildly pop popular, you know, with the with the public. It's just a matter of now getting legislation to mandate that manufacturers do provide it. Right now, do you have to work like, for example, your country is sort of set up in the same way ours is, where you got the federal government and they cover certain things, and then the provincial governments and you have state governments. And here, where we are, they have a lot of power over many areas, I, I think probably the greatest scope. And then we have municipal and sometimes regional, well, it'll be a group of cities. So are you working, kind of working at all those levels? Yeah, we work, you know, largely at the state level and somewhat okay. at the federal level. Um, you know, as you might've noticed lately, our Congress has not been the most efficient or getting the most done. So um, that's that said, you know, we continue to work that, but states are really where we think that we can make the most change. Okay. Um, and, you know, we've actually seen this model work for automobiles. So back in 2012, the state of Massachusetts passed a right to repair bill for, for cars um, that would make sure that third party technicians had access to the software tools that they needed to fix to repair cars. Um, so that consumers wouldn't be stuck just going back to the dealership. Um, that passed with something like 85% of the vote, huge portion. And once it passed in Massachusetts, all the manufacturers came to the table and signed um, 
an agreement to um, make that essentially the law of the land because they didn't want to, you know, have to deal with different regulations in different places. So, you know, our theory is that if we can, that's a um, repeatable model. So we are definitely continuing to pursue at the state level, these kind of right to repair initiatives. Okay. Now you were saying in this blog post, it says introducing junked by design. You're talking about there's three larger problems. And I think you've, you've talked about that, that, um, what was that first one? Manufactured of tech products. They see it as a barrier to future profits. So yeah, that's the first one. And then the second one is that now we've got this, uh, these smart products, everything is smart and it's got this kind of, um, technology within it where you can actually communicate with it so thieves love it because they can just kind of stand outside your house and they have this little techie thing and they can communicate with your car keys and beep beep your car's open and they didn't even have to break through the window or anything they just take your car right (laughs) there's all kinds of things like that happening now and hackers can even hack these things and um and so it's just like um and then the things are built as you were saying the third point was like they're designed to be replaced every couple of years. So you're dealing with these these issues. I'm just wondering, do you wanted to say anything more about like, for example, smart products or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's just the fact of the matter is, is as software creeps into all of our products, um, this is the trend that we're seeing that the line of ownership is being blurred such that, you know, you may own the physical device, but, um, the company that made it will claim that they own the, the, the code and the operating software, um, which has made things a lot fuzzier. It's made it so that, you know, I think that's kind of crazy. I think I bought the thing and I should be able to do what I want with it. Um, but now they're kind of arguing against that. So it's, it's an unfortunate reality. And that's, it's a big part of what we're trying to fight against um, as a part of the right to repair movement. Right. Now, isn't that opening a whole can of worms when you're talking about ownership right because that's that's getting into some legal logistics there right like you buy something previously we think yeah we own 100 percent of it but now there might be a certain percentage that the company say well we still own it it's kind of like you know my mortgage with the bank right it's like you, you think you own the house but you you still have this connection this legal connection and you still owe right so so it's kind of it's kind of scary when you buy these products from companies and then you're not the outright owner. And so therefore you can't fix it because they say, wow, you're messing with our source code. You're messing with our you're messing with the ingredients of KFC or Coke or whatever, right? <laughs> so they're just like, wow, okay. And and now with this, um, it's called Internet of Things, right? Where mm-hmm. all these like refrigerators and your coffee maker and different things end up having a, uh, this kind of software in it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've seen everything, you know, from tennis shoes to toothbrushes that are connected now to the internet and you can operate with some app on your phone. Okay. Now do you just kind of pick, um, do you pick any one industry that's because it's the hot topic of the day or is it you're 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 you've got a systematic list you're working through? Like how do you prioritize? Um, when you say you know prioritize, what what do you mean by that? Like for example, like whatever's your latest latest campaign, right? Because you know when you're dealing with these laws, right? It could be like mostly focused on um, say cell phone manufacturers, right? Mm. Or say other things like like for example when you're pushing states to put in these right to repair repair laws are they kind of like blanket laws that will cover every kind of industry or is it focused on just specific industries yeah yeah great question um so when we start we do kind of adopt a more um you know umbrella definition of consumer products or Um, you know, just things that run based on embedded software, um, digital devices, things like that. So we do at the start, want to pass a right to repair bill that would cover consumer technology, household um, appliances, agricultural equipment, medical equipment, 
because ultimately we think that for all of those things, this still makes sense, right? What, regardless of what industry it is, um, we should be able to fix it. Um, now, sometimes we do narrow things down based upon, you know, frankly, the political will in a given state and um, seeing what is something that um, could realistically pass because we know that while the end goal is to, to win on all of those fronts, um, anything we can do to move things in the right direction, even if it's just cell phones or just home appliances, um, is a good step in the right direction. So we're, we want to continue to work that and push it forward. Okay, so how does it work? Like, um, now I'll give you an example. I think there's actually three Canadian politicians that are working with um, US PERG. And uh, I think one is Ontario and another couple of provinces, but they tried to push through legislation. I think it was a year, year and a half ago for right to repair. And it didn't, it didn't really pass or didn't go through. So of course they can try again, right, over time. <laughs> but this is what you do, like um, in, in some sense is working with some of these policymakers on trying to pass the legislation and go through the different stages until it actually becomes um, new law. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, we don't always pass on the first time, but, um, you know, we think that ultimately our argument is sound and it's something that people really agree with. So um, we do our best to just continue to try and win hearts and minds and get the public on our side. And then as a result, get um, policymakers on our side as well, because, you know, it's something that I think we all agree with. I think, you know, it's a, it's a matter of democracy. It's a matter of agency. If it's my thing, I should be able to do what I want with it. I probably said that about 15 times so far, Finn, but um, at the end of the day, that's what it really boils down to. Right, right. But um, one thing, though, I think that for a lot of people, this is not on the radar screen. Um, well, of course, with COVID, nothing else is on a radar screen, right? But sure. it's like, um, yeah, I just, that's why I'm doing this podcast, too. I, I think that this is actually one of the key issues that we, that many people might forget about. And I did see that on your website, and then there's a few other websites that talk about, okay, there is like public support, like at least whatever, 70, 80% of the people, they really want this happening, right? But I do think that it needs to, you know, the old proverb, it says the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So I think the the wheel needs to squeak more, right? Well, that's what I'm here to do, Vin. I'm squeaking as loud as I can. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And we've seen polling that shows that once people understand what rights repair is, they overwhelmingly support it. It is somewhat of a matter of just finding out about it. So, you know, we just got to keep beating the drum and talking about it. Um, and ultimately, I think that that's the way that we'll win. Okay, well, we're with you. And we'll see how much we can do this in Canada. I'm with you. I want to see this awesome. happen because I have, I think, a couple junked computers that I don't dare throw out. I don't know why there's just something in me. I just like, did I get all the data out? I just can't throw it out. And I think I've got like three or four cell phones just kind of sitting there. I just don't dare to throw them out. And it's like, wouldn't it be nice for other people to be able to use them, right? Without finding all my right. deep, dark secrets from five years ago. But right, if it, other people can use right. them and I can maybe buy a used one that's not going to break tomorrow. So that's a wonderful thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, totally agree. all right. I want to thank you, Kevin. Thanks for this uh, podcast here. And um, I know these are trying times. Sometimes it's uh, hard to get for me just to get my thoughts together because we're so worried about COVID and oh, 3 p.m. We get our numbers for our province like, oh, how many are they today? Right. So I know. Sure. And, and then plus what you've been going through there in the USA with the election and et cetera, et cetera. It's it's sometimes kind of hard to, to focus, right? So I think that what you're doing there is very important. So I'm glad that we can take this time to, to focus on it. So thanks a lot, Kevin. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, stay healthy and hope all is well. Okay, take care. Hi, everybody. Season three continues. Today we have Kevin O'Reilly. He's with US Perg, And I'm entitling this Unjunked by design and a little bio for Kevin here. He, let me get it here. He's an advocate for the right to repair campaign. And he started there at US Perg 2018. He helps run the right to repair campaign. And he, he previously got his start as a change core organizer where he worked with Mighty Earth to call on Bridgestone. So that's a big 
global corporation, he got on, he called on Bridgestone to stop deforestation and human exploitation for natural rubber because that's how they make tires, right? He also led an effort to get a majority of both houses of the Massachusetts State Legislature to co-sponsor the 100% Renewable Energy Act. So Kevin lives in Somerville, Massachusetts, where he enjoys reading, running, and rooting for his Oakland A's from afar. So this is kind of a new thing, doing the bio at the end. And also, here is my disclaimer. Everything Kevin or I have said is our own opinion and doesn't necessarily reflect the organizations we work for or volunteer for. And also, these comments we have made are not legal, medical, or any other kind of special professional advice. So I want to thank all my listeners for listening to this podcast and I wish you a safe month and a safe year. Thanks a lot and peace out.